Hello everyone, welcome to or back to my channel. My name is Annie and today I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I read in July this year. I'm gonna start with a DNF and it kind of sucks because I've heard a lot of people really like this book and I wanted to like it and I didn't hate it, I just didn't like it enough to want to continue reading it and that is Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garman. This is a story about this woman named Elizabeth Zott who is a chemist in the 50s i believe and she is facing all of the problems that you'd expect a woman in her field to be facing during that time period it's really interesting to read about actually and i love her character i just feel like it wasn't it wasn't working for me i didn't hate it there were some aspects of the book that felt really unrealistic to me concerning a dog and a baby if you know you know, I just felt like that kind of pulled me out of the story and made me feel like I was reading something that wasn't really real and it made the whole book feel a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> Again, I didn't hate it. I just didn't want to spend my time reading it when there were other books I could read that I would maybe love more. So the first book I read this month and completed, starting out really strong, is My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. I gave this book five stars. It blew me away it was really hard to read and the story was just beautifully written and the subject matter was perfectly handled so my dark vanessa follows this girl named vanessa she is a student at this private school and she gets groomed by her english teacher and it sort of takes over her whole life and we actually see her when she's like in her 30s i believe versus her when she's 15 and in her 30s, in that time period, there is Me Too happening. So people are coming to her asking her if she wants to come out about what happened to her, but she still hasn't come to terms with what actually happened. She still thinks that she wanted everything that happened between her and this professor. And so you see her kind of coming to terms with the reality of what happened and her recollecting a bunch of repressed memories. And it's really powerful and it made me cry and it's a beautiful book and there were so many sections that just i felt so deeply even though i haven't been through that same situation i think i could definitely relate to other areas of it and it's a book i'll never forget honestly i want to buy a copy of it the prose was super immersive it was an incredible portrayal of ptsd sexual assault rape um and very sensitive towards those issues obviously major trigger warnings this book is very difficult to read at times but so worth it if you do get to finish it obviously don't read it if you're not in the place to read it right now i don't want you to do that don't do it something i liked was that in any sort of intimate scenes and just in general grooming wasn't romanticized at all because that can be a big thing that we do in our culture is like ooh, i got with a professor and you know it can end up being sexualized as opposed to being seen for how gross it is and even just the whole time you got a sense that this was really disgusting nothing was ever romanticized nothing was ever cute in the intimate scenes you were probably I was like visibly cringing. If you want a powerful like quote from it, at one point someone says to Vanessa, I believe it's her therapist, like, you were just trying to go to school. I think a lot of women can relate to that sentence except like fill in the blank, like you were just trying to blank and then something happened that you didn't consent to. I also liked how Vanessa's journey wasn't fully linear. It wasn't like she just had this aha moment and was like, wow, I see what's been happening to me like sometimes she's mean to other women and judgmental and sometimes she's really not a likable character but it all makes so much sense with what happened also i think that the portions that were written for when vanessa was 15 are so incredibly accurate to how you feel when you're 15 and a girl i was listening to this interview that was actually included in the end of my audiobook by kate elizabeth russell and she was saying that she actually started writing the book when she was about 15. So I think that's why it reads so accurately. And I just loved it. I think it was perfect beginning to end. Just a perfect book. Very hard to read, hard to talk about, but 
incredible and something I won't forget. I need to read more by Kate Elizabeth Russell. Next book I read is Happy Place by Emily Henry and I have I left my copy of this back at my house. The saga continues with our plumbing if you saw in one of my other videos. I think it was my fourth wing video. <laughs> how the plumbing in our house is messed up. And anyway, we're not living at home right now, but I left my copy of Happy Place over there. So Happy Place by Emily Henry, it's about a group of friends that go on a trip every summer and Harriet and Wynne are a couple in this friend group. It's, the friend group is three couples, essentially. They were engaged, Harriet and Wynne, and then for some reason, their engagement ended about, I think like six months before the book is set in a four minute phone call. And we get the book from Harriet's perspective. Wynn broke up with her and she's really sad. And so they had kind of agreed, we're not gonna go on this trip together. Like Harriet was just supposed to go and Wynn was supposed to stay at home. However, when she gets there, Wynn is there and she finds out it's because their friends are getting married. And the thing is that Harriet and Wynn have not told their friends yet that they've broken up because they're worried about causing drama in their friend group and they just thought it would be too much to deal with. So they're having to pretend to stay together while well, all their friends, all their closest, their closest friends think that they're together. There was no sense that the friendships were very strong in this novel. It was lots of telling and not showing. We were told that these were Harriet and Wynne's closest friends and that they had this amazing, like unshakable bond with their friends. But that just, it didn't read like that. And the characters didn't seem to have any trust in each other. There was lots of miscommunication throughout the whole friendship group, let alone Harriet and Wynne. And that just got to be frustrating. I don't typically read romance, but I've read all of her books because I do really like her as an author. And in this book, the banter was bantering. There was lots of like quippy dialogue and stuff like that. And that was nice to read. And I did like reading it. During the summer, I read it on a camping trip and that was fun and like, you know, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. And I think the characters just didn't feel very vivid to me and that's a big part of why. We know things about Harriet and Wynne. Like we know that Harriet cleans when she's stressed and that Wynne is insecure, but he covers it up with jokes. But I didn't feel like they were real people. And I think that that hindered my enjoyment of the book unfortunately. I gave it 3.5 stars. Next up, I read a short story called Lawns by Mona Simpson, and this was actually recommended by Kate Elizabeth Russell in the interview I listened to after finishing My Dark Vanessa. It was also really hard to read. I can see why she recommended it for after you've read My Dark Vanessa. Major trigger warnings for incest, grooming, and sexual assault slash rape. The story focuses on a student at university who has very destructive habits. She is in a bit of an unhealthy kind of tumultuous relationship with this guy. She also works at a mail room at the university and randomly steals people's mail, which is very unhinged. She appears to be underdeveloped in some ways and still kind of thinks about drama from high school and stuff. Uh, and I won't say much more because it's a short story, but definitely, definitely he, he the trigger warnings um because i mean them it's really hard to read but it's stunning it's stunning the writing was simplistic but it really cut you and i remember i was taking this short story writing class last year and we learned all sorts of stuff about what a good short story should have and this had pretty much all of it like it started right in the middle of things the writing was clear and concise but still packed a punch and the ending was at the perfect place where you still felt like there was more to the story but you also felt satisfied with it and it was moving i cried it did really get to me and it's gonna stick with me and i want to read more from mona simpson because that was amazing i gave it a four out of five next up i have some things from the halloween readathon i was going to do a whole vlog on it and then I lost some footage, so I couldn't, but I did participate. So next few books are gonna be horror thriller books. First being The Last House on Nicholas Street by Katrina Ward. This book was so good, so good. I gave it a 4.5 out of five, but it might be a five 
star now that I'm thinking about it. It follows this man named Ted and he lives in this house. It's the last house on Euless Street. He lives there with his cat, Olivia, and his daughter, Lauren. This seems a little bit weird that you would have a daughter um, because he's very, you get the sense pretty quickly that he's not mentally completely well. He is very childish and some of the things he says and does while also being extremely creepy, but then you kind of feel bad about that as the reader because you're like, okay, well, if he has a mental condition, I don't want to think he's creepy, but he is. The cat and the daughter don't like each other, so they're never really around each other at the same time. Lauren doesn't seem to be able to walk very well and is very confined to the house and there's all these little peepholes in the walls so that's creepy and then there's another aspect to the story which is that this girl went missing 11 years ago and her name was laura she went missing by this lake near his house and ted was a suspect they searched his house but they couldn't find anything laura's sister d who feels a bit of guilt because she was supposed to be watching her sister when she went missing thinks it was ted and begins to investigate him on her own this book had lots of twists and turns i expected the first twist from the first chapter but it wasn't disappointing to me and then i sort of like guessed at the next one but i was like that's too crazy and then it happened and the third one I just didn't see coming at all. In no way did that make it any less satisfying. This book was brilliant. Me describing what it's about, you have no idea what it's really about. Like, no idea. And I felt like it was real. I felt like I could see the house. I was thinking about it the other day, like, and I finished it pretty early on into this month. It's really stuck with me and it's very good. And I want to read more of Katrina Ward in the future. After that, I read Things Have Gotten Worse and Other Misfortunes by Eric LaRocca. Now, I wanted to read something from LaRocca for ages and I hadn't, so I was excited to read his short story collection, especially Things Have Gotten Worse since we last spoke. So I'll give you synopses of each of the short stories and tell you my thoughts. So Things Have Gotten Worse since we last spoke. It's the story of two women who meet in a queer online chat room in the early 2000s. They start their conversation by talking about an apple peeler and then things kind of devolve into this very toxic controlling relationship between the two of them and things get weird and gruesome and you find out at the beginning that one of them dies and the other one is a suspect. I liked this. I didn't love it. I think because it's all through their emails. That's all that you get of the story. It's said that this is like court evidence. So you get to look at the emails and I just don't think that epistolary um, stories are really my thing. But at the same time, I did find it really creepy. There are elements of body horror throughout this short story collection. So at some points I was visibly like, ugh. <laughs> looking at it yeah overall i did like it i didn't love it as much as i thought it would i would and i think that's just because of the hype the next short story in the collection was the enchantment which i think was my favorite atmospherically it's about this very religious family who discover along with the rest of the world that an afterlife has been disproven so we have hard evidence that nothing happens after we die and the son, upon hearing this, it's a couple and their son, commits suicide in a very interesting way. And the husband and wife, whose marriage is crumbling, they're about to get a divorce, receive a note from him before he passes that says that you two have to stay together. And that's all I want. And so six months later, they go, it's very The Shining, they're going to watch this hotel during its off season and it's kind of just on this rock in the middle of nowhere like in the sea it's a seaside hotel and they're staying in this guest house that's like on an island and one night they hear a knock on the door and they get a very strange visitor i really liked this one at the beginning the emotions were super high just from the jump and you could feel the stress of all the characters. It was also written in different points of view. I think they were all third person limited, but you'd get the point of view from the husband's perspective and the wife's perspective, which I really like. The atmosphere, as I mentioned, was just incredible. The writing was beautiful. However, 
at the end i didn't really like it it felt like it lost steam emotionally i also honestly have no idea what happened at the end i don't i couldn't explain the ending to you i have no idea what happened i looked it up i still can't figure it out maybe i'm not like big brain enough but i could not i could not figure it out so that sucks but i gave that one a 3.5 out of 5. i gave things have gotten worse since we last spoke a three now the last story in the collection is called you'll find it's like that all over and this one i thought was the best it wasn't my favorite but it was the best and it was the shortest one it was about 20 pages and it's about this guy who finds a bone in his yard while he's snuffling shoveling up snow and it has his neighbor's initials on it so he goes to his neighbor and he's like yo i found this bone in my yard like what's going on and the neighbor invites him to do all these dares and they get kind of increasingly crazy and i really liked it i think that it was structured really well it felt intense and the stakes felt high and it was all about how you want to like prove something to this person you don't even know he wanted to do this to be polite and he didn't feel like he could back out of doing these dares because he and his neighbor had never really had a strong relationship but he didn't want to have a bad relationship to his neighbor like if you could find a common thread that runs through it would be people influencing other people and people exerting control over other people and people wanting to conform to the will of other people which i just found so interesting so i gave the last story a four out of five and overall for the short story collection it was a 3.5 maybe a 4 out of 5 i did really like it and i'm excited to read more from Maraca in the future the last thing that i read for the summer ween readathon was night film by marisha pestel this book i actually read a long time ago like in middle school maybe me and my brother both read it and we really liked it it's a mixed media book about this famous director named cordova and cordova makes these films called night films which are intensely polarizing very scary very very dark horror movies and they have this sort of underground following but there's big debate in society about them about whether things this dark should even be made whether cordova is a psychopath is it disturbing that all these people follow his work does that mean that there's something wrong with them does that mean that there's something wrong with all of us if we're so intrigued by these dark things and cordova's followers sort of see his work as enlightening they think that fear is the base human emotion and that if you ex truly experience fear you can be liberated don't know exactly how that works the book explains it really well but there's this journalist named scott mcgrath and he basically tried to call out cordova based on this anonymous phone call he had gotten years ago and he made some very polarizing comments about cordova on a talk show and Cordova basically ruined his whole career. Now, Cordova's daughter Ashley has just committed suicide when the book opens, and we follow Scott, who just can't resist exploring Ashley and her life as well as Cordova. And it takes off from there. There's a lot that happens. It's crazy. It was really good. I felt like it was a little bit long. My other biggest critique is it feels like it was written by a man. <laughs> It wasn't actually written by a man, but it feels that way. The female characters aren't fully fleshed out. They seem very mystical. I didn't really like that. There's some casual transphobia and racism, which I also didn't appreciate. It's supposed to be set in 2011, but still. With that aside, I thought it was really good. The ending, I'm still unsure how I feel about it, but I really am glad that I got to reread this book, although it's very long. It felt really long but I would still recommend it very highly. Next up, I read Heartstopper Volume 3 by Alice Oseman. This is actually Volume 4, which I still need to read, but I returned my third volume to the library, and I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. So Heartstopper follows Charlie and Nick. They are two students in secondary school in the UK, and they start a relationship. I don't think that that's a spoiler, but they're really cute, and it's so heartwarming and Alice Oseman does all of the art which is also just like the art is really cute and I am like always just chuckling and smiling and feeling so disgustingly happy when I read these 
and the second season of Heartstopper is coming out on Netflix in two days. So I'm really excited. I need to rewatch the first one. But the reason I rated this one a 3.5 was just because I think that this series discusses some very mature topics even if it does it in a very light-hearted way and I feel like sometimes the conversations are a little bit too simplistic that we're having about homophobia or specifically in this one eating disorders as someone who's had an eating disorder in the past I'm very picky about representation of eating disorders in literature and any sort of media and I just felt like the depiction wasn't as complex as I'd like to see. Now, are these known for super complex depictions of things? No. Am I happy to just let it be what it is? Yes, however, that was my critique. And I'm excited to read the fourth one, which is this one, look how cute. So, I mean, I'm gonna continue on with this anyway. I love it, what can I say? Next up, I have another five-star read, which was Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. I've read this book so many times, but I hadn't read it in years when I picked it up on audio. It didn't disappoint, honestly. So Anne of Green Gables follows this girl named Anne, and she is an orphan. She comes to live with a brother and sister named Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert, and they're expecting to get a boy to help them do work on their farm, but they get Anne instead. And Anne is this, like, I, the only word I can really think of to describe her is queer, not like, um, <laughs> not like sexuality queer, but just a little bit weird and quirky. And she's always talking about whether there's scope for imagination in a place, and she gives names to things like the white way of delight, and which is like this row of trees in bloom and the lake of shining waters and stuff. And she just really, if someone says like romanticize your life, like she is the prime example of someone who does that. It just kind of follows her life and her little hijinks in Green Gables. And I love it. When I was a kid, I used to read this and like compare myself to Anne because I was very like, I don't know, I was super into books, which Anne is, and I was just a little, I always felt like I was so weird and different and not like the other girls. So I was like, oh my God, I'm literally Anne Shirley. This is crazy. <laughs> but it was really good reading it again. I also just feel like the people in these books are real and that's so important to me as a reader. Like I could just imagine meeting the Cuthberts and Anne and Gilbert. I gave this five stars and I'm gonna continue reading the series. Also, should I watch Anne with an E because I have a soft spot in my heart for this older adaptation of Anne of Green Gables and I loved it and I watched it a lot growing up but I tried watching Anne with an E and I got 30 minutes in and I just couldn't get with the way that the girl spoke Anne's lines. I know that they're really hard to deliver because she says some weird things but I just couldn't get it. But should I? Next up, we have Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. And I have a full video on that if you would like to see my thoughts. Uh, because I have a lot of them, I'm gonna keep it brief here. So if you wanna see that video, you can. I gave it a one out of five stars. It's about this girl named Violet who goes to this school for dragon riding and there's a man there and he's hulking and mysterious and has scars and something happens between them and it's enemies to lovers. I feel like that's all the synopsis I'm gonna give. This book is super hyped so I went into it with high expectations. I might have given it a higher rating if so many people hadn't said oh my god this is like the best book ever. The hype was just so big and so many people are saying that this is like their favorite book of the year and I just can't get behind it. The writing was bad, the world building was non-existent, and the characters were bad and that's what I'm going to say about it. Next, I read The Stranger by Albert Camus, and this is the story of a man named Mersault. I hope I'm saying that right. He gets drawn into a murder. That's all I'm going to say because this is a very short book. I don't really want to give it away. You know what? I'll read the back. Since it was first published in English in 1946, Albert Camus' first novel, The Stranger, Le Tranger, has found has had a profound impact on millions of American readers. Through the story of an ordinary man who unwittingly gets drawn into a senseless murder on a sun-drenched Algerian beach, wow, um, Camus explored what he termed the nakedness of man faced with the absurd. I liked this a lot. Um, I, Albert Camus, he's a philosopher and I 
kind of always just say like he's my favorite philosopher he's the one i agree with the most but i haven't ever read fully one of his works so i'm an imposter basically i read part of the myth of sisyphus but i couldn't get through it but this i finished and i it definitely took me a while to think about its ending actually there's this amazing video by i believe the black ponderer is his name and his video on this is beautiful and explains really well Camus and his ideas but I thought it was really interesting to read because a lot of people compare Merceau to Camus. I helped me think about what things I agree with Camus on and what things I don't and now I can finally say I've read something by him so that's good. I then read Hell's Paradise to Gokuraku volume 4 by Yuki Kaku. This is the story of Gabi Maru the Hollow who is a ninja and he is this criminal he's about to be sentenced to death his muscles and stuff are so strong from all his training that he physically can't be killed by these people trying to execute him and then this woman sagiri comes out and is like hey i'm a samurai and you should come with me because i can see that you don't want to die so i'm going to give you an opportunity to be pardoned so basically the shogun sends all these criminals paired with these samurai to go to this island and find this thing called the elixir of life which is supposed to grant immortality and whoever finds it will get to be pardoned of all their crimes it's sort of hunger games e but manga and this is the first manga i've ever read i am enjoying it this volume i didn't as much I just think this one was lots of action sequences and I find those really hard to follow in manga and also I'm more of a character driven reader so I just wanted more development from the characters and less plot 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 even though I do think the plot is interesting. So I'm gonna keep going with this one, I just think this has put me in a little bit of a manga slump unfortunately. Last but not least we have A Curious Beginning by Deanna Rayborn. This is probably one of my favorite books i've read this year i can just tell i finished it in january and i just reread it so that i can read the second book in the series which i own i'm looking at it right now a perilous undertaking i've talked about this before on my channel so i keep my synopsis a little bit short but if you want to know a detailed synopsis you can go to my first video on my channel which is my uh mid-year book freak out tag video so this follows a woman named veronica speedwell she lives in victorian era england and she is a lepidopterist which means she collects and studies butterflies <laughs> and she goes on expeditions all around the world to do that now the story begins when her aunt nell passes away and we find out that veronica is an orphan and has always lived with her two aunts uh nell and lucy and now Nell has passed away, Lucy passed away a few years ago, so Veronica is now kind of free in the world and is planning on going on this big expedition to hunt some more butterflies. However, when she goes home from the funeral, she finds someone breaking into her house and they try to kidnap her. And then this guy saves her named the Baron and he like whisks her away to London and he's like, your life is in danger, come with me. And she's sort of like, okay it's probably not but like i'll come with you i needed to get to london anyway <laughs> and then he places her in the care of this man named stoker who is a natural historian and a taxidermist <laughs> a match made in heaven look at them but then the baron dies and veronica and stoker go out to figure out why he died and if it's connected to veronica's past at all this book is so good the characters are just stunning veronica is like a very strong kind of well-possessed well-balanced woman and the way that she says things like she just has all these little witty things she says that just totally eviscerate any man she talks to that thinks she's being ridiculous she's like a genius and she is a brilliant detective and stoker is basically like her assistant although he's also really strong and he also goes on like these research expedition so they really respect each other and I could just go on about this for ages but I just had to reread it so that my memory will be fresh for when I read A Perilous Undertaking which is the second book in the series. If you take one recommendation from this video, well okay two, let it be My Dark Vanessa and the Veronica Speedwell series because these books just make me so happy. I don't know what it is. Those are all the books I have read this past month. Let me know what you 
a reading let me know what you think if you've read any of the books i'm reading if you want me to read any books that you just love let me know in the comments I'm always happy to hear from any of you. Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you want to. And if you do subscribe, click the little bell icon just so you can be sure to get notified every time I upload. Have a great day, evening, morning, whatever you're doing right now. Hope you're enjoying it. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.